Chapter 11 of Dinosaurs, with special reference to the American Museum Collections by William Diller Matthew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Smith, New Orleans, Louisiana. Chapter 11, Part 3. Feeding Habits of the Giant Dinosaurs. We still have to solve one of the most perplexing problems of fossil physiology. How did the very small head, provided with light jaws, slender and spoon-shaped teeth confined to the anterior region, suffice to provide food for these monsters? I have advanced the idea that the food of Diplodocus consisted of some very abundant and nutritious species of water plant, that the clawed feet were used in uprooting such plants, while the delicate anterior teeth were employed only for drawing them out of the water, that the plants were drawn down the throat in large quantities without mastication since there were no grinding or back teeth whatever in this animal. Unfortunately for this theory, it is now found that the front feet were not provided with many claws, there being only a single claw on the inner side. Nevertheless, by some such means as this, these enormous animals could have obtained sufficient food in the water to support their great bulk the carnivorous dinosaurs mingling with the larger bones in the quarry are the more or less perfect remains of swamp turtles of dwarf crocodiles of the entirely different group of plated dinosaurs or stegosauria but especially of two entirely distinct kinds of large and small flesh-eating dinosaurs the latter rounded out and gave variety to the dinosaur society and there is no doubt that they served the savage but useful purpose rendered familiar by the doctrine of malthus of checking overpopulation these fierce animals had the same remote ancestry as the giant dinosaurs but had gradually acquired entirely different habits and appearance Far inferior in size, they were superior in agility, exclusively bipedal, with very long, powerful hind limbs upon which they advanced by running or springing, and with short forelimbs, the exact uses of which are difficult to ascertain. Both hands and feet were provided with powerful tearing claws on the hind foot is the back claw so characteristic of the birds which during the triassic period left its faint impression almost everywhere in the famous connecticut valley imprints of these animals that the forelimb and hand were of some distinct use is proved by the enormous size of the thumb claw while the hand may not have conveyed food to the mouth, it may have served to seize and tear the prey. As to the actual pose in feeding, there can be little doubt as to its general similarity to that of the raptories among the birds, as suggested to me by Dr. Wortman. One of the hind feet rested on the prey, the other upon the ground, the body being further balanced or supported by the vertebrae of the tail. The animal was thus in a position to apply its teeth and exert all the power of its very powerful arched back in tearing off its food. That the gristle of the bone or cartilage was very palatable is attested not only by the tooth marks upon these bones, but by many similar markings found in the bone cabin quarry. The bird-catching dinosaur. 
of all the bird-like dinosaurs which have been discovered none possesses greater similitude to the birds than the gem of the quarry the little animal about seven feet in length which we have named ornitholestes or the bird-catching dinosaur it was a marvel of speed agility and delicacy of construction externally its bones are simple and solid looking but as a matter of fact they are mere shells the walls being hardly thicker than paper the entire interior of the bone having been removed by the action of the same marvelous law of adaptation which sculptured the vertebrae of its huge contemporaries there is no evidence however that these hollow bones were filled with air from the lungs as in the case of the bones of birds the foot is bird-like the hand is still more so in fact no dinosaur hand has ever before been found which so closely mimics that of a bird in the great elongation of the first or index finger in the abbreviation of the thumb and middle finger and in the reduction of the ring finger these fingers with sharp claws were not strong enough for climbing and the only special fitness we have been able to imagine is that they were used for the grasping of a light and agile prey another reason for the venture of designating this animal as the bird catcher is that the jurassic birds not thus far discovered in america but known from the archaeopteryx of germany were not so active or such strong flyers as existing birds in fact they were not unlike the little dinosaur itself they were toothed long-tailed short-armed the body was feathered instead of scaled they rose slowly from the ground this renders it probable that they were the prey of the smaller pneumatic built dinosaurs such as the present animal this hypothetical bird catcher seems to have been designed to spring upon a delicately built prey the structure being the very antipode of that of the large carnivorous dinosaurs a difficulty in the bird catching theory namely that the teeth are not as sharp as one would expect to find them in a flesh eater is somewhat offset by the similarity of the teeth to those of the bird eating monitor lizards varanus which are not especially sharp the great yield of the quarry our explorations in the quarry began in the spring of 1898 and have continued ever since during favorable weather. The total area explored at the close of the sixth year was 7,250 square feet. Not one of the 12 foot squares into which the quarry was plotted lacked its covering of bones, and in some cases the bones were two or three deep. Each year we have expected to come to the end of this great deposit, but it still yields a large return, although we have reason to believe that we have exhausted the richest portions we have taken up four hundred and eighty three parts of animals some of which may belong to the same individuals these were packed in two hundred and seventy five boxes representing a gross weight of nearly one hundred thousand pounds reckoning from the number of thigh bones we reach as a rough estimate of the total seventy three animals of the following kinds giant herbivorous dinosaurs 44 plated herbivorous dinosaurs or stegosaurs 3 iguanodonts or smaller herbivorous dinosaurs 4 large carnivorous dinosaurs 6 small carnivorous dinosaurs 3 
crocodiles four turtles five but this represents only a part of the whole deposit which we know to be of twice the extent already explored and these figures do not include the bones which were partly washed out and used in the construction of the bone cabin the grand total would probably include parts of over one hundred giant dinosaurs the struggle for existence among the dinosaurs never in the whole history of the world as we now know it have there been such remarkable land scenes as were presented when the reign of these titanic reptiles was at its climax it was also the prevailing life picture of england germany south america and india we can imagine herds of these creatures from fifty to eighty feet in length with limbs and gait analogous to those of gigantic elephants but with bodies extending through the long flexible and tapering necks into the diminutive heads and reaching back into the equally long and still more tapering tails the four or five varieties which existed together were each fitted to some special mode of life some living more exclusively on land others for longer periods in the water the competition for existence was not only with the great carnivorous dinosaurs but with other kinds of herbivorous dinosaurs the iguanodonts which had much smaller bodies to sustain and a much superior tooth mechanism for the taking of food the cutting off of this giant dinosaur dynasty was nearly if not quite simultaneous the world over the explanation which is deducible from similar catastrophes to other large types of animals is that a very large frame with a limited and specialized set of teeth fitted only to a certain special food is a dangerous combination of characters such a monster organism is no longer adaptable any serious change of conditions which would tend to eliminate the special food would also eliminate these great animals as a necessary consequence there is an entirely different class of explanations however to be considered which are consistent both with the continued fitness of structure of the giant dinosaurs themselves and with the survival of their special food such for example as the introduction of a new enemy more deadly even than the great carnivorous dinosaurs among such theories the most ingenious is that of the late professor cope who suggested that some of the small inoffensive and inconspicuous forms of jurassic mammals of the size of the shrew and the hedgehog contracted the habit of seeking out the nests of these dinosaurs gnawing through the shells of their eggs and thus destroying the young the appearance or evolution of any egg destroying animals whether reptiles or mammals which could attack this great race at such a defenseless point would be rapidly followed by its extinction we must accordingly be on the alert for all possible theories of extinction and these theories themselves will fall under the universal principle of the survival of the fittest until we approximate or actually hit upon the truth fossil hunting by boat in canada by barnum brown how do you know where to look for fossils is a common question in general it may be answered that the surface of north america has been pretty well explored by government surveys and scientific expeditions and the geologic age of the larger areas determined most important in determining the geologic sequence of the earth's strata are the fossil remains of animal and plant life 
a grouping of distinct species of fossils correlated with stratigraphic characters in the rocks determines these subdivisions when a collection of fossils is desired to represent a certain period exploring parties are sent to these known areas sometimes however chance information leads up to most important discoveries such as resulted from the work of the past two seasons in alberta canada a visitor to the museum mr j l wagner while examining our mineral collections saw the large bones in the reptile hall and remarked to the curator of mineralogy that he had seen many similar bones near his ranch in the red deer canyon of alberta after talking some time an invitation was extended to the writer to visit his home and prospect the canyon accordingly in the fall of nineteen o nine a preliminary trip was made to the locality from didsbury a little town north of calgary the writer drove eastward ninety miles to the red deer river through a portion of the newly opened grain belt of alberta destined in the near future to produce a large part of the world's bread near the railroad the land is mostly under cultivation and comfortable homes and bountiful grain fields testify to the rich nature of the soil a few miles eastward the brushland gives way to a level expanse of grass-covered prairie dotted here and there by large and small lakes probably of glacial origin mile after mile the road follows section lines and one is rarely out of sight of the house of some homesteader it is through this level farmland that the red deer river wends its way flowing through a canyon far below the surface near wagner's ranch the canyon was prospected and so many bones found that it appeared most desirable to do extended searching along the river usually fossils are found in badlands where extensive areas are denuded of grass and the surface eroded into hills and ravines a camp is located near some spring or stream and collectors ride or walk over miles of these exposures in each direction till the region is thoroughly explored quite different are the conditions on the red deer river cutting through the prairie land the river had formed a canyon two to five hundred feet deep and rarely more than a mile wide at the top in places the walls are nearly perpendicular and the river winds in its narrow valley touching one side then crossing to the other so that it is impossible to follow up or down its course any great distance even on horseback it was evident that the most feasible way to work these banks was from a boat consequently in the summer of nineteen ten our party proceeded to the town of red deer where the calgary edmonton railroad crosses the river there a flat boat twelve by thirty feet in dimension was constructed on lines similar to a western ferry boat having a carrying capacity of eight tons with a twenty-two foot oar at each end to direct its course the rapid current averaging about four miles per hour precluded any thought of going upstream in a large boat so it was constructed on lines sufficiently generous to form a living boat as well as to carry the season's collection of fossils supplied with a season's provisions lumber for boxes and plaster for encasing bones we began our fossil cruise down a canyon which once echoed songs of the bois brule for this was at one time the fur territory of the great hudson bay company no more interesting or instructive journey has ever been taken by the writer 
high up on the plateau buildings and haystacks proclaim a well-settled country but habitations are rarely seen from the river and for miles we floated through picturesque solitude unbroken save by the roar of the rapids especially characteristic of this canyon are the slides where the current setting against the bank has undermined it until a mountain of earth slips into the river in some cases almost choking its course a continual sorting thus goes on the finer material being carried away while the boulders are left as barriers forming slow-moving reaches of calm water and stretches of rapids difficult to navigate during low water in one of these slides we found several small mammal jaws and teeth not known before from Canada associated with fossil clamshells of Eocene age. The long midsummer days in latitude 52 degrees gave many working hours, but with frequent stops to prospect the banks, we rarely floated more than 20 miles per day. An occasional flock of ducks and geese were disturbed as our boat approached, and bank beaver houses were frequently passed, but few of the animals were seen during the daytime. Tying the boat to a tree at night, we would go ashore to camp among the trees, where, after dinner, pipes were smoked in the glow of a great campfire only a fossil hunter or a desert traveler can fully appreciate the luxury of abundant wood and running water in the stillness of the night the underworld was alive and many little feet rustled the leaves where daylight disclosed no sound then the beaver and muskrat swam up to investigate this new intruder while from the treetops came the constant query who who for seventy miles the country is thickly wooded with pine and poplar the stately spruce trees silhouetted against the sky adding a charm to the ever-changing scene nature has also been kind to the treeless regions beyond for underneath the fertile prairie veins of good lignite coal of varying thickness are successively cut by the river in many places these are worked in the river banks during winter one vein of excellent quality is eighteen feet thick though usually they are much thinner the government right has been taken to mine most of this coal outcropping along the river along the upper portion of the stream are banks of eocene age from which shells and mammal jaws were secured but near the town of content where the river bends southward a new series of rocks appeared and in these our search was rewarded by finding dinosaur bones similar to those seen at wagner's ranch specimens were found in increasing numbers as we continued our journey and progress down the river was necessarily much slower frequently the boat would be tied up a week or more at one camp while we searched the banks examining the cliffs layer by layer that no fossil might escape observation with the little dinghy the opposite side of the river was reached so that both sides were covered at the same time from one camp as soon as a mile or more had been prospected or a new specimen secured the boat was dropped down to a new convenient anchorage box after box was added to the collection till scarcely a cubit space remained unoccupied on board our fossil ark where prairie badlands are eroded in innumerable buttes and ravines it is always doubtful if one has seen all exposures so there was peculiar satisfaction in making a thorough search of these river banks knowing that few if any fossils had escaped observation 
on account of the heavy rainfall and frequent sliding of banks new fossils are exposed every season so that in a few years these same banks can again be explored profitably this river will become as classic hunting ground for reptile remains as the badlands of south dakota are for mammals although the summer days are long in this latitude the season is short and thousands of geese flying southward foretell the early winter where the temperature is not infrequently forty to sixty degrees below zero in winter it is difficult to think of a time when a warm climate could have prevailed yet such condition is indicated by the fossil plants when the weather became too cold to work with plaster the fossils were shipped from a branch railroad forty-five miles distant the camp material was stored for the winter and with block and tackle the big boat was hauled up on shore above the reach of high water in the summer of nineteen eleven the boat was recalked and again launched when we continued our search from the point at which work closed the previous year during the summer we were visited by the museum's president professor henry fairfield osborne and one of the trustees mr madison grant a canoeing trip one of great interest and pleasure was taken with our visitors covering two hundred and fifty miles down the river from the town of red deer during which valuable material was added to the collection and important geological data secured as a result of the canadian work the museum is enriched by a magnificent collection of cretaceous fossils some of which are new to science end of chapter eleven part three end of dinosaurs with special reference to the american museum collections by william diller matthew